All right, I think we're going to go ahead um, and get started. My name is Leslie Kanan, and I'm the Senior Manager for Preserving Black Churches. And welcome to our Preserving Black Churches question and answer session. And I want to welcome you all. And so first, I want to let you know that if you have any questions, to use the Q&A function that is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will not be answering any questions in the chat. Feel free to use the chat to um, talk to each other. Uh, we will also be using the chat function um, to drop helpful links um, throughout the presentation, but we won't be actually answering any questions in the chat. So again, if you do have any questions for us, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. I would also note that closed captioning is enabled. So if you do need that function, please use, please use the closed captioning button at the bottom of your screen. I would also, um, next slide please. I would also note that this session is being recorded um, so for those of you who are registered, um, we will be um, sending a recording of this session um, to via email within the next few days. I just want to remind you um, that um, during this session, we will also have both live Q&A and we will also, we did get from many of you um, pre-submitted um, questions and later in the session, um, we will be dropping those in the chat as well. And now I would like to introduce you to Alaska McGinnis, um, the director of our national grant program. Hello everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to discuss this incredible program with the African American uh, Cultural Heritage Action Fund. Um, I, my, I am Alaska McGinnis, the director of the National Grants Program, and I really wanted to meet and discuss with you some tips to remember in terms of this process overall and what you would need to do in order to submit an application for this opportunity. Um, first tip, of course, being that the applications are due on August 23rd at 11.59 local time, your time, um, and for information on exactly what we're looking to learn from the questions on this application, we have a pre recorded informational webinar at savingplaces.org backslash black dash churches. This is basically our frequently asked questions page. Um, that link will be included in the chat. Um, this informational webinar is incredibly informative. Um, we have information there that literally walks through the entire application and gives applicants an idea as to what we're looking to see in the answers. So giving you some clarity and some direction on exactly how to best present the information that you're sharing with us um, in submitting this um, proposal. Next, um, we really encourage everyone to take time to review the guidelines and eligibility that's available on our website as well, on our um, guidelines page. All of the information there is incredibly useful. A lot of the information there is actually what we would directly refer to in some of the questions that were submitted via the registration process for this webinar. So again, we encourage you to really take some time and look at that before starting your application, just to make sure that your church is um, one that would align with these eligibility requirements. Another tip, is once you are in a space where you're ready to sit down and complete this application, number one, I, I, it's something I'd like you to note is this is a pretty lengthy and very involved application process. So please do give yourself a significant amount of time to work on it. Um, this isn't one of those that you would wanna wait until the day before it's due or the day of. It really will probably take a little time to gather all the data that you need to submit this application in full. Um, also note that when you're filling out any narrative on this application, that spaces count toward that, whatever it is, say 500 character limit, spaces do count towards that, toward that 500. So try to be succinct in those places. And as a side note, I'll add here um, that when you're completing the application and you are giving us information on the historic historical significance of your church, please be mindful of 
um, the content there as it as it's not necessarily looking for like a, a list of the senior uh, members of your church and their tenure there and what they were able to accomplish. It's really looking not necessarily toward uh, a historical telling of exactly who uh, played a leadership role at the church, but more so the historical significance in terms of the institution and its relationship to the community at large. So that's a, another tip that I wanted to make sure folks are mindful of as they're completing these applications. Um, also, make sure that the main contact for the grant is the person that would steward this process from beginning to end and be a, a readily available point of contact for us as administrators. Um, sometimes folks will place the person um, as the main contact who is, say, a senior member of the, um, the institution, say, the senior pastor or someone along those lines, but they may not necessarily be the person who would be uh, working on the, the process in terms of the grant application on a day-to-day -day basis. So that may be a secretary, that may be a deacon, whoever may, it may be, please make sure that they are the main contact um, and able to readily receive and send emails about the application status and answer any questions that may arise from us. Um, note that if your organization is already in the system, that you will get a warning, basically indicating that um, the, the information that you're enter, entering is similar to something that's already there. At that point, you would reach out to us at actionfundgrants at savingplaces.org, and we would work with you to make sure that we can get you logged into the system. Also, as a, a final kind of tip, all questions on the application that have an asterisk next to it, they are required. So um, there's uh, quite a few questions that are not optional in this application. So you will want to make sure that you completed all of those questions in order to submit um, your application. Um, additionally, these three email addresses are the ones that you would be engaging with the most. Um, and so we would ask that you kind of save, you save these at email addresses and make sure that they're not um, in your, headed to your junk folders. Um, for system questions, login questions, or anything uh, around the system that you're, any challenges that you're running into, definitely reach out to us at actionfundgrants at savingplaces.org. And um, ideally for your questions that are more specific to your project, and if you wanted to make an appointment for office hours, please email blackchurches at savingplaces.org. Please note, if you're looking to reach out for office hours. We're definitely going to inquire and get a little bit more information from you about um, what you're looking to discuss in those office hours. So again, we can't stress enough how, it's, how important it is to really familiarize yourself with those guidelines and those frequently asked questions so that by the time you're meeting with a staff member, um, you're, you're aware of where you are and you're, we're a little bit more clear on exactly what your, um, what your issue is and how we can help you. Um, Let's see. And now we have our eligibility discussion and I will turn it back over to Leslie. Thank you. When I was looking at uh, some of the pre-submitted questions, there are two things um, that came up. Um, one was there were a lot of questions about eligibility. And so I just wanted to go over this briefly. And the first is, so what is a black church? And there are a couple components that go into this. One is religious buildings built and erected by black congregations and continuously occupied by active black congregations. But also it could be religious buildings designed and or constructed by, by black architects or builders currently occupied by active congregations or repurposed for arts, culture, community and social justice programs. But they could also be religious buildings not originally built by or for Black congregations, but continuously occupied by active Black congregations for at least 50 years. And then, as you see on our screen here, we have a list of all sorts of um, active historic Black congregations. And so every once in a while, I get a question about um, a, a, a denomination that's not on here. And so of course we couldn't list every single um, denomination. So it's, it's not meant to be if your denomination is not on here that that means that you, um, 
that you're not eligible. Um, and so just always reach out to us at um, Black Churches at SavingPlaces.org um, if you have um, a question or you think that your denomination um, is, in, is in question because it, this is not an exhaustive list. Um, the main question is, you know, is your, you know, is, are you an active historic Black congregation is what we are looking for. And that includes non-denominational um, churches. We also get questions um, about non-Christian churches and we can look at those on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, so reach out to us about those as well. Next slide, please. The other question um, that we got both in our um, in questions that were pre-submitted and a lot in our session yesterday had to do with what makes a good application and what makes a bad application. And so our general criteria are, you know, historic and cultural significance, leadership support, planning and project development, capacity to manage grant projects, capacity for continued stewardship and maintenance, and capacity to leverage grant funding. So how does that actually connect to the application components themselves and how we look at your application? So how that translates is as we're looking at your application, the first thing is when we look at historical and cultural significance in your application, is that clear? Have you shown us that your, that your resource in question is historically significant? That doesn't mean that someone famous was there. It could mean that it's historically significant locally. It's historically significant regionally. It could also be historically significant nationally. It doesn't have to be locally designated, but you do need to clearly show to us um, that the resource is historically significant. And I wanna reiterate what Alaska said about, I also, there were a lot of churches that says, well, our congregation is 200 years old. It's a hundred years old. Um, that doesn't mean that we want you to, you know, cover that 200 years of history by telling us every single pastor over the 200 years, really focus on um, how your church is connected to African-American history, thinking about that you do only have so much space and you want to really show us um, what the historical and cultural significant is. Um, you want to give us a sense of readiness. Is your project going to be ready to go? If we were to grant you, grant you the money, is your, are you ready to start your project? And there are questions in the application um, that let us know that, and that has to do with planning. Have you done planning around your project? Are you ready to go? The other thing that we want to know, and this is really important, has to do with preservation and sustaining of the resource. We want to know if the work that you're doing is going to lead to the preservation and sustaining of your building, of your church. Is the work that you're doing going to lead to that? And so you need to show us um, with the project that you're proposing that that's what's going to happen in the end. And that leads me to the next thing, which is a clear scope of work. You wanna make sure in your application that you're clearly showing us what your project is. Even if that means that you're using bullet points, what is your project? And that leads me to the last point, And that is, what is your budget? And that means not a single number. If you're asking for $200,000, don't just put $200,000 on your budget. Break down that budget and show us how that budget is related to your scope of work. And really show us that those are real numbers, that you really thought about how much this is going to cost and how it's related to your scope of work. And if you have all that, um, then that is going to be a competitive um, project. I will say overall, though, is that we got 1,300 applications last year. And it's a very competitive application and we and they're really wonderful projects. And so a lot of times the reason why people weren't funded is not because it wasn't an amazing project. It's because there's just so many amazing projects and we can't fund them all. And a lot of times the feedback is you had an amazing project and we just didn't and there was just too much need. 
but if you want to have a great project, make sure that your application components um, are really clear and have all of these things in it. That would be my advice. And now um, I want to move into your um, questions and answers. And if we could, uh, for those pre-submitted um, um, answers, or I'm sorry, um, questions, if we can drop those into the chat. So I'll start with um, what does it mean to be a steward of the church? We have the church church's permission to apply for this grant on her on her behalf, but we have a separate preservation nonprofit. So being a steward of the church means basically the person or the group that basically um, takes care of the church. And it sounds like in this situation, um, perhaps maybe they're not the 501c3. So maybe they're asking you to apply um, on their behalf. So maybe you're going to be the fiscal agent. Um, maybe that's the situation and, and that's perfectly fine. That happens all the time uh, where you have another uh, nonprofit who's a 501c3 that acts um, as a fiscal agent on behalf um, of another organization and that's perfectly fine. Um, that's actually a great um, situation because there are churches that are not 501c3s. And I'll answer that more broadly because this question comes up a lot is does a church have to be a 501c3? And I will tell you, if you are not a 501c3, you do need to have another 501c3 as a fiscal agent in order to receive the funds. The next question is, I work for Preservation Texas. We are currently administrating a 750,000 run grant. This is funding 11 capital projects across the state for rural black historic buildings, several of which are churches, congregations. These desperately need funding for continuing phases of structure of construction. Can we apply on behalf of a historic black church, um, perhaps in the capacity of, as, as a fiscal sponsor? Um, absolutely, absolutely you can uh, um, apply. Um, and again, in the case of Preservation Texas um, is, is a perfect example of a fiscal sponsor. Um, we've had other similar, um, you know, state organizations of this kind um, be uh, fiscal sponsors. Um, so the answer is yes. Alaska, you were, did you want to answer a question? You're on mute. Apologies. All right, I just wanted to clean up a, a couple of those that were um, um, answered already in the in the, the groupings for the Q&A. Um, and now I'll answer this question. How can we best determine whether to use a capital project or a project planning for funding? So for this one, definitely a hard look at the, um, the, intended impact associated with each of these funding categories um, compared to what you're looking to do with your institution. These are very different in terms of the use of funds for these different, for these specific categories. Um, again, project planning is just as it's described, it is intended to be not funding utilized for any work on a physical space, so much so as it's meant to support the development of a plan. Um, for a, a potential new project for your church. So if you needed a little bit more support in developing what this proposal should look like, this is one that you would probably want to reach out to us to kind of flesh out what you're looking to do and help you select what category would fit best for what you're looking to kind of gain support for at your specific church. Um, I have another question here. What do you do to resolve the warning signal from the system um, because your organization is already in the system? This is one um, where, as I mentioned before, you would want to reach out to us at actionfundgrants at savingplaces.org, and we can look into this issue for you to reconcile what existing profile is in the system versus your login information so that we can get you set up and um, able to apply for uh, for this opportunity.
Okay, there's one that says the church we are wanting to preserve was a one room schoolhouse. Currently the building is used for an annual homecoming. The building was the African American school in a rural area in Southwest Virginia. Since we meet one time a year, are we eligible? Um, as long as the building is a church and, and, and meets uh, the requirements for um, a historic black church, um, what you would want to um, apply for is as a non-active church. So you'd be eligible for less money. Um, so let's say you were doing a capital project, you'd be eligible for 100,000 as opposed to 200,000. Um, but as, as long as it's a church building, um, you would be eligible even if it was used um, as a schoolhouse. Uh, there's another question. The pictures of churches awarded grants for 2023 are all relatively large structure. Uh, to what extent are small churches able to be awarded a grant? Um, and definitely um, small churches are able to be awarded a grant. I can think of at least um, two or three on our list that were um, smaller churches um, and more rural churches. And I know that we definitely have concerns about smaller and rural churches. As a matter of fact, we actually have a researcher um, whose project is all about looking at um, the barriers of preserving uh, rural uh, black churches. So we definitely have concerns about that. Um, so definitely um, small churches are able um, to get grants. And I have another question here asking, can there be multiple persons for contact purposes? Yes, you can have multiple contacts in the system for um, contacts for this particular grant. However, there will be a main um, point of contact for, say, default messages around the application status. The system will notif notify one email um, to remind um, remind you about follow-up documents or remind you that the application is due, anything like that. So. That main point of contact is definitely an important one, but you can have multiple people attached to um, a profile and an application um, within the system. Here's a question. Uh, milestones are missed through no fault of the awardee. Is there a process to accelerate um, activities to help the awardee get back on track? An example would be a delay in funds distribution. Are there funds that were not used in the last cycle that could be made available to awardees that not, did not receive the full ask? Um, so number one, they, they're, they're not funds that were not used from um, the last um, cycle. We definitely used um, all of our funds from the last cycle. Um, so I'm trying, let me read this again. Milestones are missed through no fault of the awardee. Is there a process to accelerate activities to help the awardee get back on track? Um, we can always, you know, help. We we have um, technical assistance for all of our awardees. Um, we work with them, you know, very closely um, to help get them on track and 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 figure out, um, you know, what's going on. Um, so you can always, once you're, we start working with you, we will work very close closely with you. Um, to you know, keep you on track and 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 make sure that your project is going well. Whether that's um, you know a delay in a in in getting a ward or or a problem with a contractor or a problem with materials, whatever that is, we'll always work uh, with our grantees. Um, this is a quick question. How many projects will be funded? We don't know exactly what that number is, but so far we're at roughly 30. Um, and I think I anticipate that we'll be in that range um, this year. Um, so again, the volume of um, applications as we anticipate will be roughly a thousand or, or more. So again, we, we have to stress um, to everyone uh, that engages in this process that it is a highly, highly competitive process um, with a lot of need, a lot of um, very um, significant work that's happening across the country and everyone, there's not a lot uh, enough opportunities like this one for folks to seek out support um, for their initiatives and for their buildings. And so it's important that folks really take the time to 
work on these applications and be as clear and descriptive and um, intentional as possible in completing these applications and give yourself time to do so as opposed to waiting to that last week because um, there will be a high demand um, in terms of the inquiries that we will receive. As you can see tonight, we are a pretty lean team. And while we have the desire to reach out and give everyone that personal um, response and engagement around the questions they have toward the, the those last few weeks leading up to the due date, the demand will be so high that inevitably there will be people that we just can't get to. So we encourage everyone to be proactive and try to get to this and start working on this as quickly as you can so that we can be responsive and answer any more direct questions and offer that service. Because as you know, come the week of the 23rd, when say almost a thousand people are working on this and have questions, we it's, it's tough. It's going to be difficult to really get to everyone that we, as we would like. So it's, it's, it's definitely important that folks are proactive here. And again, we anticipate it'll be in the range of roughly 30 projects that will be funded. There's a question about whether this is an annual grant. Uh, we certainly hope so. Um, this is only our um, second round and we're planning on having um, another round um, next year. And we'll, we certainly hope that we'll be able to um, continue. Uh, the next question is if there's a scoring guide available to applicants um, and there's not, um, the only thing we can um, sort of offer you is the guidance um, that I offered um, earlier. And of course, if you have, um, you know, more questions and need more help with your application, we have our one-on-one -on -one sessions that we have through our office hours that you can um, sign up for. There's a question about, will capital projects uh, for property that has been purchased by the historic church be considered? Um, certainly, well, so if, so not for properties that have been purchased by the church. So if it's, unless it is a historic church that, that they've purchased. Um, so this program is only for historic um, churches and also possibly um, auxiliary um, buildings such as parsonages and things like that. Um, that also meet those requirements, but not for other um, properties, um, just that the church has purchased. Uh, what is the likelihood, wait, oh, there it is. <laughs> what is the likelihood that a church with less than 30 members would be selected for this grant? Um, that's certainly a possibility. I mean, we've had um, non-active uh, churches um, selected um, we certainly had um, members with, I mean, churches with less than 30 members um, selected as well. Um, it's really about um, whether going back to sort of the components of the application that I talked about, about whether they're showing through their application, historic significance, readiness, um, ability to preserve and sustain the building. It, it really goes back to that as opposed to um, the number of members. Um, I have uh, a question. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Alaska. Okay. Um, I have a question here. What if you started on a project and need um, the financing to complete it? So um, this is a really good question as it's one that's kind of come up um, so far in the, the process with uh, applicants. It's important to note that the funds for this particular grant cycle will, number one, not be paid out until we are um, pretty clearly in 2024. Number two, the all work and um, the all of the work that is specific to this project should not have any um, work completed or in process that these funds are intended for. Um, because there is a, an element of this that's, that's clear and outlined in the grant agreement that you'll need to sign before starting on any of this work. So well, there's an aspect of this that's associated with competitive bids. There's an aspect that's associated with getting approval um, for any uh, contractors. There's a scope of work process. So there's a lot of elements that need to be kind of addressed and reviewed by our internal team before the actual um, funding is paid out. So we would definitely want any 
work that's happening now that you were looking to have action fund support apply to kind of cease. And then we would essentially, if it's phased work, I feel like that there's there's a way to discuss and we would encourage you to reach out to us via Black Churches at savingplaces.org so we can get some clarity on what's happening right now. But as a default, yes, we would like for there to be a starting, a very clear starting point where action fund resources will be utilized for any projects um, based on um, the signing of the grant agreement as the beginning of that work. Um, let me know if I've missed anything there, Leslie. See. If we applied in the first round, do we concentrate on where we were lacking or should we resubmit the information we previously sent? Um, so if you, the one thing I would say, if you submitted a letter of intent last time, uh, the one thing I should clarify is that we are not um, asking for letters of intent this time. We're asking for full applications and full applications require a lot more information than the letter of intent did. Um, so there's gonna be a lot more information asked of you. So you definitely want um, to consider this a whole new application and make sure that you're really um, looking at it um, as a new information as opposed to just resubmitting. You can certainly start with what you submitted last year, but um, build on that and, and making sure you're thinking about um, the advice that we talked about tonight. Um, watch the video and think about um, what we say in the video about in terms of what we're looking for. Also think about if you um, get stuck or you have questions, think about reaching out to us uh, for office hours to talk about, to talk to staff, if you have some questions about um, individual sections. So I definitely say to, to, to build off what you did um, last year, but consider this a new, a new application. The next question is, can um, for-profit companies or B Corp companies with, um, work with a Black church to respond to this grant opportunity? So um, on this one, I, I think I need some clarity here on um, what is meant by responding to this grant opportunity. And um, we definitely need some clarity on exactly what that would mean for the payout of the grant. Um, we are a um, nonprofit organization that is going to, um, as a default, be um, paying out these grant funds to a nonprofit organization. Um, so, when, of course, when I when I read for profit, my um, you know um, attention is peaked there. I think that this is one that would warrant a one-on-one -on -one conversation about what that would look like and um, what we could do and what we couldn't. Next question is, are you able to allow to add, um, allow to add a budget line for unexpected overages? Um, and yes, we see those um, in budgets all the time. Can the grant be used to correct structural damage that exists, um, such as framing and fl um, floor structures? Um, let's see, correct structural damage. I think that this is okay. Uh, Leslie, correct me if I'm wrong. This seems like this would yeah. be in line with um, the capital um, projects, even uh, actually for planning, if you needed to develop a plan to address these particular issues, to figure out what you should address first and what needs to happen in order for um, these uh, changes and corrections to be made. So yes, the answer to that is yes. Yes, and the one thing, I, I do, I do want to back up one thing, because this is a good point about the difference between submitting a capital project and submitting a planning project. Um, capital projects are our are, are most competitive project. And I would say that if you have not done planning first, if you do not, if you not, if you if you have not done some planning, then you probably will not have the most competitive capital project. And you might want to consider taking a step back and looking at a planning grant instead. As the best advice I can give you, if you are currently thinking about capital project. If you have not done any planning for it, then I would I would strongly encourage you to take a step back and considering looking at a planning grant instead. Okay. 
let's see, does the 501c3 entity have to be connected to the church? Can it be an entity that manages grants for the four community organizations? Just need clarity on this. So yes, I think this is a description of a, um, a fiscal agent, um, a, like a, a function of a fiscal agent. And yes, we would work with organizations that have such entities that are looking to support churches in this way. The next question is, the church I'm working with suffered damage from Hurricane Ian. They need a new roof, repair water damage to doors and the floor, and remove a tree that is looming over the church and could fall on it. Could all of these be bundled into one grant proposal? Absolutely. Um, and this is and this is one of those things, like this, this is what you're describing is really a scope of work here. And, you know, mm -hmm. just this is this is sort of, you know, bullet point this and sort of talk about um, exactly what needs to happen. Um, talk about how it impacts the building and how this is going to, you know, doing this work is going to help preserve and sustain the building. And you, you're on your, you're on your way to, you know, helping us understand what's going on there. Absolutely. Does an application submitted by a fiscal sponsor score lower than a congregation um, submitted application? Is there anything we should be aware of when applying as a fiscal sponsor? Um, the answer to that is definitely no. There is no lower score or, or a weighted. There is not a, a system in which we weight um, applications submitted by fiscal sponsors lower than congregation submitted applications. Um, again, the goal is on our end to make sure that we can actually award this funding. Um, in a way that is compliant, and this is a way for us to do so. So that's that would not. There's no penalty um, for um, you know organizations that have sought out the support in this way. Um, is there anything we should be aware of? Um, not beyond the default eligibility requirements and the guideline standards that will be um, that are readily available online. There's no special like allowances that I should make note of here, unless I'm missing something. Please let me know, um, Kelly or Leslie. No, only that they have to be a nonprofit fiscal sponsor. Um, the next question is, is this for work on the physical building? Um, and yes, the, the, well, the only, well, it depends on uh, the, the type of project. It does relate to the physical building. So for instance, um, if you're doing interpretation, uh, some folks do interpretation on the site related to the church. We, we've seen that. Um, there are also, um, some people do um, planning projects and one of those planning projects could be a cemetery, but that's not physical work. Um, that's a planning project about cemetery, which is not a physical building. Um, and then there's endowments, which is related to the physical building, but it's not physical work. So it depends on the project, but usually it's related to the physical building, yes. But it does depend on the project. For the capital projects, do you have um, do you have to have estimates from a contractor to do structural or repairs to our church, and is it required for the application? Um, so, this is information that yes, we would need at some point in the process. We do have a space um, for this information to be uploaded on the application, but at this point, it is not required to have all of this information. Um, but it is helpful again to demonstrate readiness, um, I would say, and in terms of like estimates, yes, we did, We th again, there's a space for this, but it's not a place that is required for this one on the application, am I correct, Leslie? Say again. There's a space for um, information in terms of um, estimates and contractor quotes and things like that on the yeah. application, but it's not at this point required. This, we will get into that if you're, um, project is selected and you are um, an organization that we're working with, you're considered a grantee, and then we will absolutely kind of look to that documentation, review it with you, and make sure that it's a, an approved scope of work before paying out the grant. 
10, churches hire for-profit consultants to respond to this grant opportunity and include it as preservation pers um, personnel. Um, yes. Um, well, in terms of helping you, um, you know, with the application, um, but when you say included as preservation personnel, I, I, I think I need a, a little bit of clarification there. So in terms of if you're asking someone to um, help you put the application together, um, you can do that, but you can't um, ask for reimbursement um, for work that's already been done. So I guess that's, I, I just wanna make sure, so you can't, so you can ask for someone to respond to this, but you can't, when you're putting in your budget, you can't be reimbursed for work that's already been done. So just wanna make sure that yes, you can use for-profit consultants. So when you're putting your budget together, if there's a consultant that you wanna use in your future project, if you were granted, yes, those can be for-profit consultants. But if you're asking for someone to help you put together your grant now, you can't then um, use the grant if you were given the money to then pay that person that already did the work. I just wanna make sure that that's clear. And give me one second, just uh, responding to another question there. All right, please care, um, clarify that the repurposed arts, cultural, community, and social justice program um, this use must be also be designed or constructed by a black architect or builder. Um, I'm a little confused by what by this question. Um, what they're talking about this there, and I need to pull up this exact quote because it's a little out of context. This this is the definition of a black church. Is they're pulling out I see. A piece of a quote from that. Um, and so I need to look at the full quote <laughs> to, to see where, what exactly that says, because out of, out of context, I can't, um, out of context, it's, 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 it's throwing me off a bit. Um, this was hold, hold, on, hold on a quick sec, because it's actually in our um, in our PowerPoint deck. But it's it it has to do with a with a non it, it has to do with a non-active church uh, or non-active congregation in a church that uh, in a build in a church that's now being repurposed uh, for a different use. I see. So this is the part where we, we indicate that um, religious historic um, buildings that were designed by Black architects or builders currently occupied by active congregations or repurposed for mm -hmm. arts, culture, community, and social justice programs. Yes. So this is a so then I would say, clarity on yeah. how we define a historic black church and really trying to the intent here as i understand it and as i i communicated with other people is to make sure that we are um capturing churches that have been repurposed and are doing other work in the community um and wanting to make sure that those organizations are represented in this application pool mm -hmm. um, but again with the intent that they are organizations that are were established as black um yes. spaces that yes. is the point is, is really like ensuring that the origin was specific um, to the benefit of the black community, wherever, um, wherever it was based. Yes. Let's see. Does, does capital expenses such as AC, church signs, landscaping apply um, or qualify? My apologies. So AC, um, there's a conversation to be had there. Um, that, but that again, that's that's one that there's a, a discussion to be had. 
a more direct conversation again because I know that they're it's technically kind of outside of the eligibility requirements but there are there is a space in which the discussion is had about like just generally the health and the ability to provide um services without HVAC. Um, but the church signs and landscaping, those are two that would fall um, outside, um, as I understand it, unless there is like a very specific historical significance on the signage. Is there a loophole there, Leslie? But no, we, we haven't so. done we haven't done church signs or landscaping. Signage, and okay. HVAC would really be on a would be on a case by case basis. I thought so, yeah. So that's one that you would definitely want to reach out to us to so that we could get some clarity on exactly what the situation was there. Let's see, can you apply under multiple categories for the grant submission, or is it one for one relationship? Um, yeah, so you you can submit. So one organization um, can submit for different categories. So, but it's it's a separate application um, for one category for for each. I'm sorry for each category. So you'd have to submit a separate application for each category. Um, the one thing I would say though is that um, you would only be you could only ever be um, funded for one category. So one organization could only be funded uh, for one category, um, and you won't be able to choose. What'll wind up happening is that we will look at whatever application is, is strongest in terms of as we review um, the different ones. Um, so, um, but if you apply for too many, it can sometimes cause a little confusion. So I would, I would really look at what is the priority um, for your church or, you know, for your organization. Um, you know, I wouldn't suggest that you apply for all categories. You could do that, <laughs> but um, technically you could do that, uh, but um, really look at what's the priority because sometimes what happens is people, I've seen people submit applications that contradict each other and can somehow, and can sometimes as we read over both of them actually weaken both. Um, so just be careful when um, submitting multiple applications, because I've actually seen when we start to compare them that what winds up happening is they is you wind up weakening both your applications by submitting multiple ones. But yes, you can do it. Got it. Um, for, for historical churches from rural areas without an org, um, org administration capacity, um, what can be um, strategies of support? So for this one, we definitely want to make sure that we are really uh, supporting and intentional about offering our support to um, historical church churches in rural areas. And we really are looking to offer a specific level of TA to those um, institutions. Um, please be in touch with us to kind of clarify your needs in this space. Um, it, if you're talking about the um, or, organizational capacity actual grant, um, I'm hoping I'm not reading this um, incorrectly, but if you're talking about organizational capacity in terms of the, the grant, this is a opportunity that we are looking to support a paid staff position that is unique to the preservation needs of the institution. Um, so that's really the core of what we're looking to support there, or in some cases, part-time work, but again, toward the same end. Um, do you read that um, question any other way? Well, um, if I read another way, if it's not read that way, the other way that I could read it is if they're saying that they don't have administrative capacity, what are some of the other ways that they could get support. Like let's say they let's say they're not um, going after organizational capacity. Like what are some of the ways that they could get support? And it's interesting because it depends on where you are. Um, some rural areas, depending on where you are, might be near um, 
a university, like I think about someplace like Tuskegee, um, which is, you know, more, more rural. And so you might be near a college or university depending on, you know, where you are. Um, you might also be, be near another church. Um, churches can sometimes um, um, rely on each other. You might be able to find um, a volunteer, like a student, maybe like a high school student. It depends on what um, type of um, support, but I agree with Alaska that if we know more about your situation, because um, I think about a particular church that's in a rural area that we happen to know that there was a bigger project nearby in a bigger, it was in a bigger city, but we started thinking, huh, I wonder if we can ask for support from another project to help out in this, this smaller community. So if you um, reach out to us and, and let us know where you are and where you might need help, then we might be able to um, figure out how we can be more helpful or if we know any um, resources or talk about strategies. Because like I said, it's actually something that we are working on a project on. We are actually now working on a project on the barriers of um, preserving Black churches in rural areas and figuring out how we can be more helpful. So please, um, um, Sister Calloway, um, sorry for calling you out. Um, um, please reach out to us at um, Black Churches at savingplaces.org. I'd love to talk to you um, about the barriers that you're experiencing, whether this is specifically for a capacity um, grant or whether you're talking about strategies of support in general. I'd love to talk to, um, more about you and anyone else on this call, frankly, that's living in a rural area. We really would love to talk to you whether it's about this grant in particular or just generally, because um, we really are um, looking into that and trying to figure out how we can help. Thank you. Let's see. Must the church have to um, have remained in the same physical location throughout its existence? Um, the answer to that is no, um, but we do require that the um, congregation be based in the current location for at least 50 years. Um, but no, it does not have to be based in one exclusive location throughout its history and its existence um, in general. Um, but again, it does have to meet that 50, to 50 year um, threshold in order to be considered for this particular uh, program. See, if we do not have a 501c3 status, but have a IRS letter of determination, do we need to have a 501c3 um, organization to serve as our fiscal agent? So ideally, this um, status will be um, formalized at the time of grant awarding. So we would encourage, well, we would essentially, no, not encourage, we would require that you keep us posted on this, the IRS status. Um, otherwise, yes, we would have to utilize or have you utilize a fiscal agent. Um, but ideally, that 501c3 status would be in place um, as you start this application process. Sometimes it's better for organizations to just wait until it's in place. But if we understand if those, if your need is, is very specific and you want to go ahead and, and put your hat in the ring now, totally understandable. But we would prefer that obviously that that be in place, but we do work with organizations as long as there is either um, a fiscal agent that you can utilize and or at least a process and we know that you are in the process of, of getting that determination. So the next question is, are we eligible for less money if the black congregation has moved buildings and is now renting to the church, renting to the church to a predominantly white congregation? So I think I'd need to understand a little bit more about this situation, because now we have a situation where it's not a Black congregation, but is the church itself, was it built for, built for African Americans? Um, so I think this is a situation where you should contact us directly at um, Black Churches at SavingPlaces.org um, to give us um, a little bit more information. 
um, is a vacant church building that was home to Black congregations uh, eligible? If yes, may funds be used to plan adaptive reuse to church-owned community um, health care facility? So um, we do fund like churches that are not active, number one. Um, but if there are plans to reuse this for, for this specific purpose, this is, this is a little different because again, I'm thinking about the typical default uh, guidelines, which indicate something that is specific, it's arts-based, it's a community like a gathering space. This one is, this one's tough. I'm not sure. We would probably need to have a conversation about this one. Leslie, I've not seen any applications in previous, well, any examples in um, the previous pool where they were looking to reuse the space in this way. Um. I mean, I, I I think that it was it it's it's non-active black church. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think I think it could be eligible, um, but I think they should um, contact us and we we can you know discuss it as a staff mm -hmm. um, to to double check. But I I think it I think it could be eligible. Thank you. Let's see. So this has to do, we are converting, renovating an old convent to create the African-American Pastoral Center. The convent is in need of renovations on four rooms that we will use. Currently the building is used by one community school for special needs and the KFC men's group and other church ministries. The center will be the primary center for black Catholic discernment designed to hold learning leading sessions, table talks about evangelization, Black theology, and other group meetings, which category might we consider applying for? Well, the first thing, I mean, on the face of it, it could potentially be a capital project, but that depends on if you've done planning. So my first question would be, is if you've done planning work. If you haven't done planning work, um, then then it would be planning. If you've done planning work and you're looking to do renovation, then it could be um, a capital project. Um, I would need to, there's not, a, there's not enough information here for me to determine whether it is a historic black church. Um, so we'd wanna talk about that too. So I'd, I'd, I'd wanna know if it's eligible to be a historic black church. Um, and I'd also wanna know how much planning you've done to see whether we need to do this as a planning project or whether we need to do this as a capital project. Um, so consider um, reaching out to us so that we can have some further conversations with you. And I have another question here um, that's asking, is this a reimbursement grant? Um, this is actually, uh, so there's there's several um, categories, as you know, that are associated with this particular um, opportunity. Um, and so there's no reimbursement associated with this, but there is a match associated with one of the um, opportunities and that's specifically the endowment. Um, that is a one-to-one -one match um, kind of situation, but none of these function as reimbursements um, in the sense that a lot of federal, for example, kind of grants function. So that's not the way that this works. Um, this, these grants don't work on a reimbursement basis. I think that was a, like two different um, questions that were speaking to that as a point of inquiry. And I'll go to the next one. Um, can we use a federal tax ID? Um, we are not a 501c3. Um, we have had or submit their federal tax ID information um, on these applications, but again, um, we are looking to, again, churches don't necessarily, they fall outside of that absolute requirement to um, have that 501c3 status, um, but that is something that we are looking for orgs to make sure that they do have in place 
this is one we, we would probably be in touch with you directly to confirm. And I hope I'm not misspeaking there, but I do believe that, believe that that's associated with the uh, eligibility requirements that we have um, listed. Yes, so it's it would have to be one of the three, just to clarify. Um, as a base level, historically black church with your um, federal information as you listed, a 501c3 or nonprofit organization or a public agency. So those are the three types of entities that have um, the ability to receive funds via this opportunity. And what do you look for in letters of support? Whom do you prefer they come from? Preservation specialists, architects, community leaders, church leaders. Is it a letter to support the project or that supports the organization applying? So this is one that is totally optional on the application, but um, it is one that we are looking to um, learn a little bit more about both the support for the project is ideal and support for the organization as a whole. Um, anything that speaks to, again, the historical significance um, of the organization and the impact that this project could have on the community at large is helpful. Um, any other context there, Leslie? Sorry, I was answering your question. <laughs> um, no problem. I was just making sure that I touched on everything that we thought was important in terms of the letters of support um, historical significance, um, the impact of this project on um, the larger community, and um, letters that, that support the organization that's applying. All of that is a helpful context for us as we take a look at um, these uh, applications as we're reading them. I would agree. Thank you. Our church is the first Black church in the state of Alaska and the first Black church in the history of the Southern Baptist Convention. We have structural damage inside and out. Is this grant a grant that can be used for structure repair, wiring? The church is also without any ventilation system, AC, fire sprinkler system, et cetera. Is the grants out there for us to explore? Um, definitely structural damage is definitely something um, that this um, grant can be used for. Um, and so we would, some of this, and some of this would be eligible, some of it wouldn't be. And so I think we could sort of go through some of it um, and look at the parts that are eligible and not eligible. Is a letter of determination required with the application? So, um, this is something that is required. I do believe we have a place for this on the application. I'm trying to envision um, where we have that. I don't think that that's associated with the um, actual follow-up. This is associated with the application, I do believe. Um, so I will. I would say yes. And if you have any or having any issues with this, please let us know. Um, but I do believe that this is a requirement. It's associated with the application. Does, do you have resources for grant writers to assist with applications from uh, from small churches? So we don't have uh, what we don't have is uh, resources for grant writers to assist. Um, but what we do have is we have um, one on one sessions with our staff members. If you um, have questions or need some assistance with your application, you can always email us at blackchurches at savingplaces.org and we have um, appointments that you can make with our staff um, if you run into some um, issues with your application. Okay, can another building on the campus that is used for community events such as food pantry campus or camp for kids in the community um, for community work be eligible? Um, it depends on, again, we're, we're speaking again to um, the history of this building. Um, if this is a, I guess you can describe it as an annex, um, we'd need a little bit more information on the actual structure, I do believe. I don't think that it's limited to the fact that it, it supports community events. 
but again, um, understanding its connection to the main um, church space. I think that that is an important element here. Um, so we need a little bit more information to confirm. Um, yeah, I think that that's, that's correct. Let me know if I'm clear on that, Leslie. Yeah. Okay. If we didn't get the full ask the um, last time, can we resubmit the same project so we can finish the work? Um, you can, but you would likely be less competitive because um, we would look at the fact that you did get funding um, last time because we're trying to um, help as many um, people as possible. Um, and since you did just, um, if somebody just got funding, like maybe if somebody got funding several years ago, um, we might look at that, but someone who just got funding in the last round are definitely going to be um, less competitive than um, someone who hasn't um, received any money from us recently. And this question is, is it possible for multiple churches to apply together, say in the instance of a small ch rural church um, or churches with similar projects, can they apply together in an effort to improve their chances for an award? Um, I definitely understand the logic here, um, but um, unfortunately this is one that would create a bit of it, well, quite a bit of an issue in terms of the actual process of awarding. Um, given the fact that we would need to award the support directly to a um, organization and one organization would also be held responsible in terms of the grant agreement. Um, so we don't currently have a structure built out for a kind of group um, or like grant and as this is described, um, but I do understand um, the idea being that you kind of band together to support a singular um, kind of themed project. But um, as of right now, it's not something that we've uh, kind of mapped out, mapped out a, uh, a process for how that would work um, internally. So I'm seeing now that we're actually past 10 o'clock. Mm -hmm. It's almost 10, 10 now. Well, for you on the West Coast, it's uh, a seven ten. Um, but for us, those of us on the East Coast, it's ten ten. And I do want to be uh, respectful of people's time, so we're going to take um, a few more questions. Um, there are lots more questions in in the Q and A, and we will um, we will answer those um, and get back to you. All those all those people who have put. Uh, questions in the Q&A, we will answer them um, and get back to you um, in the next um, few days as, as soon as we can. We will answer every single question. Um, but we are going to um, be wrapping up um, in the next uh, few minutes. Um, but if you do um, ha still have questions, please um, put them in the Q&A because we will in fact um, get back to you as soon as possible. Um, so the next question is, um, can you give some examples of how, of how one might document capacity for continued stewardship and maintenance and capacity to leverage the grant funding? Um, and so what I would say is that in our um, application, um, we do have prompts um, with a lot of our questions that sort of help you, um, you know, guide you how to actually um, document um, those things. So I would say pay attention to the, the different places where we have uh, different bullets um, and, you know, sort of different um, places where um, we ask um, for additional information um, to help you um, answer those answer those questions is what I would say. Um, Alaska, do you have anything to add? No, I think that's pretty clear. Okay. Um, and then there's, has there been any past applicants of historically black mega churches? Um, the one thing I would say is this, this grant, this is only our second round. Um, so we, this is, we've only done this, we've only had one round before. Um, and I'm not aware of any historically black uh, mega churches just because of the historic black requirements. Um, 
and I don't remember um, seeing any in the last round. Do you, Alaska or Kelly? I can't think of any that were included that came through that were approved that were in that. In that well, number definitely not. Team. Definitely none that got grants. I'm trying to think if we even uh, got like applications. Um, not that I can um, think of. No, I can't think of any. Yeah, no. Um, so I'll wrap up with this one last question. And again, um, as a reminder, um, we will, because um, um, there's still quite a few, uh, just to let y'all know, I don't know, there's like at least 40 more questions in the, in the, in the, in the Q&A um, to, to answer. And we will um, get to them as, as, as soon as we can, uh, we promise. Uh, but we're going to wrap up with this uh, one last question. It says, you emphasize the importance of understanding the historic significance of the church within the local community. Given that, would a capital project that preserves and upgrades portions of the church that is used primarily for outreach to the community be eligible for capital project funding? Um, and, and, and definitely, um, um, again, we're looking at um, preserving historic Black churches. Um, and so, um, and there's even a portion of the application that, that asks that, that asks what type of um, outreach um, the church is doing. It asks uh, um, what type of um, relationship that the church has with the community, what the view that the community has of um, the church. So those are definitely um, very important aspects. Um, and the, of the church's role in the community. So absolutely, um, that would be um, eligible. Thank you for that, for that question. Um, and with that, um, thank you very much um, for all of you um, who came out um, to the webinar. It's been um, great having you all here. Um, and uh, please um, check out um, the links that we dropped in the chat. Um, watch the video, um, go to the FAQs, um, read over the, the, um, the criteria. Um, please also reach out to us through blackchurches at savingplaces.org if you want to uh, make appointments with one of our staff members. And um, we will, uh, it's going to take us a few days, so please be patient with us. Um, but we will um, start getting to those questions. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I apologize. Um, that we um, couldn't get to live. Um, and thank all of you for being here. Thank you all. Have a good evening.